So far, we have discussed one major application of infrared spectroscopy in protein science. The next section introduces another important approach, which is used to study the reaction mechanism of proteins. The approach is called reaction-induced infrared difference spectroscopy, and its aim is to elucidate the molecular mechanism of proteins, as just said. Here, infrared spectroscopy is at its best, since the method combines the high time resolution and the high information content. We will see that infrared spectroscopy offers a very detailed and sensitive look into the catalytic heart of working enzymes. The sensitivity is high enough to detect environmental changes around single atoms in a large protein. An example of this are changes in hydrogen bonding. Other molecular events that can be recorded are the protonation of single residues or changes in the redox state of cofactors. Usually, a protein reaction of interest is initiated directly in the infrared cuvette and spectra before, during and after the reaction are recorded. From these spectra, different spectra are calculated that reflect only the changes of infrared absorbance. Active groups will show up, while passive groups cancel in the subtraction. A problem of infrared spectroscopy is the strong absorption of water in an interesting spectral region, which is the amide 1 range around 1640 reciprocal centimeters. This requires short path lengths in H2O of less than 10 micrometer and in D2O of 50 micrometers. Therefore, the protein concentration needs to be relatively high in order to observe single groups in the range of 0.1 to 1 millimolar. Also, adding a liquid to an existing sample is not as comfortable as, for example, invisible spectroscopy, since the infrared cuvettes are usually closed and have to be opened and reassembled for the next measurement. When studying protein reactions, one is often interested in comparing spectra of protein in different states. This would require a spectrum of protein in state A, this and reassembly of the cuvette and recording of a second spectrum of the protein in state B. This approach is not sensitive enough in most cases because of changes in the path lengths, air bubbles in the sample, slight changes in concentration, and so on. The problem is illustrated in the next slide. The blue line is the absorption spectrum of the membrane protein calcium ATPase in D2O. We can see the lipid CO double bond absorption near 1740 reciprocal centimeters, the amide 1 absorption near 1650 reciprocal centimeters, and around 1550 reciprocal centimeters, the absorption of side chains and the amide 2 absorption of amide groups that did not experience exchange of the hydrogen atom by a deuterium atom. The calcium ATPase uses the energy of ATP to pulp, pump calcium ions against the calcium concentration gradient. So there are many conformational changes when this protein is active. Nevertheless, the red line here are the largest absorbance changes that occur during the catalytic activity of this enzyme. It is a different spectrum between two protein states. Only when the scale is blown up by a factor of 100 in the bottom panel, it can be seen that the different spectrum is not just a straight line, but contains a lot of information. Such small absorbance changes cannot be detected by comparing the absorbance spectra of different samples. Therefore, special techniques are needed. They are based on triggering the protein reaction of interest in the infrared cuvette in order to avoid opening the cuvette and changing the sample. They allow to detect very small absorbance changes down to environmental changes of single amino acids in large proteins or protein complexes with, for example, 5,000 amino acids.
Some of the techniques enable time-resolved studies with a time resolution of microseconds with moderate experimental effort. These techniques are the basis of reaction-induced infrared difference spectroscopy and are briefly reviewed in the following. The figure illustrates how a typical reaction-induced difference spectrum is generated. A protein is prepared in a stable state A on the left and the absorbance of this state is measured here. Then the reaction is triggered, which is another word for initiated. The protein proce proceeds to state B and again the absorbance is recorded. State B may also be a sequence of transient states. In that case, the interconversion between the product states B1, B2 and so on can be followed by time-resolved methods. From the spectrum recorded before the start of the reaction, state A, and the spectra recorded during and after the reaction, the states B, different spectra are calculated. They originate only from those protein residues that are affected by the reaction. All passive residues have the same spectrum in both states and their contribution cancels when the different spectrum is calculated. Therefore, passive residues are invisible in the different spectrum, which therefore exhibits details of the reaction mechanism on the molecular level despite a very large background absorption of the passive groups. The bottom screen illustrates an idealized difference spectrum. The convention in the research field is that negative bands in the difference spectrum are characteristic of the initial state A, shown in blue, while positive bands reflect states B during or after the reaction, shown in red. Difference bands arise for several reasons and four examples are illustrated in the difference spectrum. A. Chemical reactions transform molecular groups from the reactant form to the product form, which usually have different infrared absorption spectra. An example is the protonation of aspartate or glutamate residues. In the different spectrum of the reaction, the absorbance of the disappearing reactant groups shows as negative band or bands, while the absorbance of the product groups give rise to a positive band or to positive bands. The bands of the appearing and disappearing groups may be widely separated in the spectrum. In the figure this is illustrated with the two difference bands marked A. Here and there for the protonation of a carboxylate group. The negative band is due to the antisymmetric stretching vibration of the carboxylate group that disappears in the course of the reaction and the positive band is due to the stretching vibration of the CO double bond of the appearing protonated carboxyl group. There are further bands due to this reaction but they are outside the spectral range shown. Alternatively, a vibration might experience a shift in frequency due to a conformational or environmental change that alters the electron density of the vibrating bonds or the coupling with other vibrations. This band shift leads to a pair of signals composed of a negative and a positive band which are close together. An example is shown for the two bands marked B in the amide 1 region of the polypeptide backbone. Here the amide 1 vibration absorbs at lower wave number in the initial state A than in the product state B. Thus there is a negative band at lower wave number and a positive band at higher wave number. In the case of the amide 1 vibration of proteins, band shifts can be ascribed to an altered coupling with neighboring amide oscillators due to a change in backbone structure or due to a different degree of hydrogen bonding, which changes the electron density in the CO double bond. A difference band with side lobes of opposite sign is produced when the width of a band changes in the reaction from state A to state B. The 
The case where a band width decreases is shown in the bottom spectrum for the bands marked with C. In this case, the intensity will decrease on the sides of the band but will increase at the center if the absorption coefficient remains constant. This leads to a positive band with negative side lobes. As the band width is a measure of conformational flexibility, decrease of the band width shown indicates a more rigid structure in the product state B. Only one band is observed when the reaction results in a change of the absorption coefficient of a vibrational mode. For example, because of polarity change of the vibrating bonds. A negative band in the different spectrum then indicates a reduced absorption of the product states B as compared to the initial state A. In contrast, a positive band indicates an increased absorption of the product state. This case is illustrated with the band marked D here, at a spectral position that is characteristic of tyrosine absorption. In the case shown, the increased absorption coefficient of tyrosine in state E may be due to an environmental change that leads to an increased polarity in the tyrosine ring. The following section discusses several ways to trigger protein reactions for infrared studies. Protein reactions that are initiated by light have been the first to be investigated by reaction-induced infrared difference spectroscopy. The protein equilibrates in the dark in the spectrometer, then it is illuminated and the transition from the dark state to the light adapted state can be investigated. This can also be done time resolved by using a short light flash. The number of proteins that can be investigated by this method is of course limited, but it is very valuable for photosynthetic proteins and for bacteriorhodopsin. Bacteriorhodopsin, shown here, is one of the proteins most intensely studied by infrared spectroscopy. It is a small integral membrane protein which converts light energy into a transmembrane proton gradient. The proton gradient is converted by the HP synthase to ATP. The protein contains the chromophore retinal, which is also present in our retina. Retinal is shown here. After absorption of a photon, retinal in bacteriorhodopsin changes its configuration from all trans to 13 cis which starts a cascade of reaction steps that transport one proton across the membrane. This involves changes in secondary structure, as well as protonation and deprotonation of several groups. The photoreaction proceeds via several intermediate states. Fortunately, high-resolution structures of the ground state, as well as of some intermediate states, are available now. However, Many fundamental facts concerning the function of bacteriorhodopsin as a proton pump, namely the identification of the critical proton donor and acceptor groups and the determination of the protonation state in the different intermediates, have been elucidated already many years ago. Since infrared difference spectroscopy is able to directly observe protonation changes of single amino acids, this method played a dominant role in this context. Many proteins bind molecules or ions. Upon addition of such compounds, protein reactions may therefore be initiated. One approach to do this is rapid mixing of solutions and this has been used for a long time in UV visible spectroscopy. The principle is shown in the figure. Two solutions are pressed into a mixing chamber, here, flow through the cuvette and replace the existing solution. Mixing starts the reaction, which then can be followed by spectroscopy. With this technique, a time resolution in the millisecond range can be achieved, which is limited by the mixing time. The small path lengths of infrared cuvettes makes the application of this technique for infrared spectroscopy very difficult, since high pressure is needed 
which causes leak problems and the high shear forces might denature some proteins. However, cuvettes have been developed first for D2O and recently for H2O, which are suitable predominantly for soluble proteins. A disadvantage of the method is that is the high consumption of material since all tubes have to be filled with concentrated protein solution. Current developments try to minimize the volume needed. The next slide illustrates the technique of attenuated total reflection, which is commonly abbreviated as ATR. A sample film, shown in black here, is prepared on an infrared transmittant crystal shown in white. This is the crystal. This is usually only possible for membrane proteins because only they attach relatively firmly to the crystal. A buffer, shown hatched, is placed on top of the film. The angle of incident of the infrared radiation here is such that the infrared light is totally reflected in the crystal like in a light guide. Upon reflection, light penetrates the sample film and may be absorbed there. Therefore, the light that reaches the detector carries the information about the infrared spectrum of the sample film. The penetration depth is on the order of the wavelength, which means that the optical thickness of the sample is small enough for measurements in aqueous films. If the protein film is thick enough, the additional buffer layer does not influence the measured spectrum because the beam does not penetrate such far into the sample. The advantage of the method is that the buffer often can be exchanged without disturbing the film. This enables many sample manipulations and makes the method quite flexible. The disadvantage is that the preparation of the film is often difficult and sometimes impossible. Sometimes the film detaches when the buffer is exchanged. Kinetic measurements are possible only for reactions that proceed on the minute's time scale or slower. Two methods to add compounds to a protein samples have been mentioned already. The stopped flow and the ATR techniques. A third method is the release of biologically relevant compounds from photolabile derivatives. These so-called cage compounds are designed to be biologically silent in the dark, which means that they do not interact with the protein of interest, but cleave off a biologically active compound upon UV illumination. The archetype of these compounds is caged ATP, shown here. ATP is stored chemical energy and required for many protein reactions. The important terminal phosphate group is protected in caged ATP, as shown here, and therefore caged ATP cannot be used as a substrate by enzymes, as also shown in the top figure, where the ATPase maintains its resting state although caged ATP is present. Upon UV illumination, ATP is released and can drive the reaction cycle of the ATPase, in which calcium is pumped from one side of the membrane to the other. Here we see the released ATP, and here we see the active protein that pumps calcium. The result of a reaction-induced infrared difference spectroscopy experiment is shown in this slide. The different spectra were obtained in a time-resolved experiment. In this example, there are three transient states. A first one seen already in the first spectrum. So these changes here. A second one that produces only minor changes, which are hard to see. And a third one that produces relatively large changes on a slower time scale. These changes here. At even longer times, the enzyme returns to the initial state and all different bands decay to zero. These spectra contain a lot of information about all that is going on in the protein when it performs its catalytic task. But it is difficult to extract this information. So, 
how are we going to interpret this kind of different spectra? One option is very simple. One can regard the spectra as a fingerprint of the conformational change. This is illustrated in the next slide. Unfortunately, a spectrum at first sight is often not very meaningful. This reminds me of my last visit in a museum of modern arts. Here you can see me meditating about the meaning of these paintings. But without a profound arts background, I have no other option than to resort to very simple comparisons. For example, I can compare the size of the paintings and realize that there are two paintings with nearly equal size, the one on the left and the one on the right. Whereas the third one is a lot smaller, this one in the middle. I can also compare the style. These two paintings on the left are similar in style, whereas the one on the right hand side is clearly different. And if I am a very patient observer, I may even notice that with time some of the paintings are exchanged for others. You may wonder what has this to do with infrared spectroscopy. These simple comparisons can also be applied to different spectra. The spectra are then regarded as a fingerprint of the conformational change. The most meaningful spectral region for this approach is the AMAT1 region, which is sensitive to backbone conformational changes. The AMAT1 signals can then be analyzed according to their magnitude, time course and similarity. That is just the same simple comparisons as in the museum. In fact, any spectroscopic signal can be used for the fingerprint approach. Thus, this approach has a long tradition, for example in the interpretation of fluorescence experiments, where changes in the fluorescence emissions were used to define high and low fluorescence state of proteins. In comparison, infrared spectroscopy provides more information because only in the AMI1 region there are around six different bands which can be positive or negative, whereas fluorescence often analyzes just one spectral feature, the intensity of the emitted light. I will illustrate this interpretation approach with one example where the simple museum approach has led to information on the molecular level but before the object of the study will be introduced. The object of the study is the nanopump calcium ATPase, which pumps two calcium ions at the expense of the hydrolysis of one ATP molecule. The calcium ATPase has a maximum extension of about 100 angstroms and consists of a single subunit composed of 1000 amino acids. It has 10 transmembrane helices in the transmembrane part and three cytoplasmic domains, the actuator domain A, the phosphorylation domain P, and the nucleotide binding domain N. Interestingly, the hot spots of this protein, fuel consumption at the top of the P domain here, and pump unit in the middle of the transmembrane domain, are coupled over a large distance, which is about 50 angstroms. The protein resides in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum in muscle cells. The transfer process is driven by ATP hydrolysis and takes place in a reaction cycle that is shown here in a simplified version. Calcium binds from the cytoplasm of muscle cells to the high affinity binding sites of the ATPase, which releases protons from the empty calcium binding sites. This activates the ATPase to use ATP as a substrate. ATP transfers its terminal phosphate group to residue aspartate 351, which leads to the formation of the first phosphoenzyme intermediate, calcium 2E1P, where the two calcium ions are occluded. So here. This means that they are buried and not accessible from either side of the membrane. In the following step, calcium is released to the lumen from low affinity binding sites. The calcium binding sites become protonated from the luminal side and the phosphoenzyme converts to the E2P form. 
dephosphorylation completes the reaction cycle. In summary, one ATP molecule is hydrolyzed, two calcium ions are transported from the cytosol to the lumen, and two to three protons are transported in the opposite direction. In what follows, I will illustrate the fingerprint approach with an example of our own research, where we have used the approach to map the ATP binding site of the ATPase. For that, we use derivatives of ATP to identify the important interactions of the ATP molecule with the substrate binding site of the ATPase. The following simple picture may visualize the approach used. Imagine to press the back of your hand into wet sand. This will generate an imprint, as shown, if the thumb points upwards. In this picture, the sand represents the protein, the hand is the ligand, with the fingers as the functional groups, and the imprint is the conformational change of the protein when the ligand binds. In our example, the four fingers interact with the protein, whereas the thumb does not. If a derivative of the molecule is used without the thumb functional group, the imprint will not change, and thus you have detected that the thumb does not interact with the protein. If instead a derivative is used without middle finger, the imprint will change, and this shows that the middle finger interacts with the protein. Screening the imprint with a number of ligand analogues will therefore identify the interacting ligand groups or, in other words, map structure interaction relationships. We can do that with infrared spectroscopy, again using the amide 1 region which monitors conformational changes of the backbone. We have mapped the ATP binding site using derivatives that were modified at the terminal phosphate group at the amino function of adenine here and at the 2 prime and 3 prime hydroxyl groups of the ribose moiety here and there. All of them induced conformational changes that were different from those of ATP. They are compared here in these panels where in black we always see the conformational changes induced by ATP and in colored we see the conformational changes by the ATP derivatives. In all cases, conformational change induced by the ATP derivatives was smaller than with ATP. Particularly drastic here upon omission of the three prime hydroxyl group. Thus, all of the modified groups seem to be important for binding, although to different degrees. This slide shows the extent of conformational change on the right hand side induced by the different ATP derivatives. The extent of conformational change was simply measured by the size of the signals in the different spectra. The smallest change is seen for modifications at the 3' hydroxyl group and the region close to the amino function of ATP. Thus, interaction between these groups and the ATPase are crucial for the conformational change. A control with AMPP and P showed that this compound gave a very similar spectrum and a very similar extent of conformational change. It is very interesting that taking away single interactions has such a strong influence on the conformational change induced by nucleotide binding. At the time of these measurements, it was known that a conformational change is needed to deliver the gamma phosphate of ATP to the phosphorylation site. Without nucleotide, the conformation is open, as shown here. So if ATP were to bind to the open conformation, as shown here, the gamma phosphate would be very far from the phosphorylation site. Here is the gamma phosphate. And here is the phosphorylation site. So there needs to be a conformational change to approach the gamma phosphate to the phosphorylation site. And this leads to a closed conformation. Now the gamma phosphate is close to the phosphorylation site. 
Obviously, the interactions between the ATPase domains and ATP are crucial to link the two domains in the closed conformation. In particular, the interactions with the ribose hydroxyls, shown here. Our results are summarized here. Without nucleotide, the conformation is open. With ATP, the conformation is closed. And with the other nucleotides, it is somewhere in between. Note that the figure illustrates an average structure, which can be a time average structure if the ATPase alters between open and closed conformations. Later it became clear that the infrared results make sense, even in the light of a subsequently published X-ray structure. This structure contained a bound nucleotide as shown in this slide. The nucleotide is shown in ball and stick representation, whereas ATPase residues are shown either as sticks or with their van der Waals radii. The X-ray structure confirms the interactions found by infrared spectroscopy and explains why the modified groups are important. Most interactions with the nucleotide are with residues in the nucleotide binding domain, which are shown in white here and this one. However, the ribose oxygens and the gamma phosphate interact with the phosphorylation domain shown in dark gray here and here. They are therefore important to link phosphorylation and nucleotide binding domain and to stabilize the closed conformation. Why then is the amino group important? When we modified this group, we re replaced it by a carbonyl group. As shown in the slide, this carbonyl group will not bind in the same way as the amino group because it will be repelled by glutamate 442. Instead, it will interact with lysine 515, which tilts the base upwards in the figure and also increases the distance between ribose hydroxyls and the phosphorylation domain. The fingerprint approach described above does not use the whole information that is encoded in the spectrum. The ultimate aim of spectrum interpretation is to assign all the bands in a different spectrum to specific molecular groups. This will then yield information on the environment and interactions of the respective groups. If this is done for time-resolved experiments, we will get a sort of movie of the molecular events that take place during the protein reaction. Again, I will illustrate the strategies for a molecular interpretation, mainly by examples from our own research. So the spectrum on this slide shows the different spectrum between two calcium ATPA states, calcium E1 and E2P. Several regions are marked in this spectrum because they give information on different functional groups. The largest bands are observed in the amide 1 region and they reveal the conformational changes of the protein. We have used this region before for the fingerprint approach. In other regions, we can see protonated carboxyl groups here, unprotonated carboxyl groups here and here, and phosphates here. We will discuss the former and the latter region in the following. When we do a band assignment, we have a problem. In most spectral regions, there are multiple assignments possible. This means that a band in a particular spectral region can be caused by several different functional groups. Only above 1700 reciprocal centimeters, protein bands can be assigned with certainty to protonated carboxyl groups, and we will now look into this region. Calcium release from the calcium ATPase is accompanied by the protonation of carboxylate groups of aspartate and or glutamate residues. Four of these residues are found in the calcium binding sites, but it's also known that not all of them get protonated. This slide shows what spectral changes we expect when carboxylate groups become protonated. In the infrared difference spectrum, 
This leads to two negative bands due to the antisymmetric and symmetric stretching CO vibrations of the ionized group. The appearing carbonyl group of the protonated carboxyl group gives rise to a positive band above 1700 reciprocal centimeters. There will be other positive and negative bands due to the protonation reaction, but they are outside the shown spectral region. In order to be sure that the signals above 1700 reciprocal centimeters really originate from the protonation of residues involved in proton countertransport, measurements of the reaction from the calcium bound state, calcium E1, to the second phosphor enzyme, E2P, were performed at different pH values. The motivation for this experiment is the fact that proton countertransport teases at high pH. Obviously, because the residues no longer become protonated at high pH. The ability to protonate is described by the pKa value of a molecule or molecular group. When the pH is equal to the pKa value, 50% of the molecular groups are protonated, 50% are unprotonated. The lower the pH, the more groups are protonated. The obtained spectra are shown in the figure. They indicated that four bands appear when E2P is formed. Here, here, here and here. That there is a band at 1720 reciprocal centimeters may not be obvious in this plot but can be seen when the high pH spectra are subtracted from the low pH spectra. Three of the bands diminish at high pH. Here, here, and here. When the band intensity is plotted against the pH value, as shown here for the high wave number band and here for the low wave number bands, the pKa of the corresponding groups can be determined. It is similar to the pKa of proton countertransport. In other words, the infrared bands disappear in the same pH range in which also proton countertransport teases. This has established that the three signals are really due to the protonation of residues involved in proton countertransport. Having assigned some of the signals to proton countertransporting residues, we can use the spectra to study their molecular environment. From the band positions, it can be concluded that the group absorbing at the high wave number of 1758 reciprocal centimeters, not hydrogen bonded at the carbonyl group, whereas the groups absorbing at 1720 and 1710 reciprocal centimeters are hydrogen bonded. Although some of the carbonyl groups are hydrogen bonded, they all reside in an overall apolar environment. This can be concluded from the high pKa values of around 8. In aqueous solution, the pKa of carboxyl groups is much lower. It is around 4. This example demonstrates that the information obtained from infrared spectroscopy can be very detailed. In order to find out exactly which residues become protonated, mutants have to be used where individual aspartate or glutamate residues are replaced by non-protonatable residues like asparagine or glutamine. This was not possible for the calcium ATPase because it turned out to be very difficult to produce enough recombinant ATPase with single amino acid replacement and because of lack of funding. Therefore, we turned to bacteriorhodopsin where mutants were extensively used to elucidate the reaction mechanism of the protein. As just said, the use of point mutations has considerably contributed to our understanding of bacteriorhodopsin's different spectra and in consequence to the understanding of the molecular mechanism of this protein. The figure shows two spectra of the reaction from the bacteriorhodopsin ground stage to the M intermediate. The positive band at 1761 reciprocal centimeters is observed for the wild type protein, but not for the protein variant, where aspartate 85 was replaced by glutamate. 
Therefore, the band in the wild type spectrum is assigned to aspartate 85. The band is in the spectral region of protonated carboxyl groups and tells us therefore that aspartate 85 is protonated in the M intermediate. The positive band appears in the ground stage to M intermediate reaction, which means that aspartate 85 becomes protonated in the reaction. Using many more single amino acid replacements, infrared spectroscopy has identified all groups that are involved in proton pumping by bacteriodopsin. In combination with time-resolved experiments, this has revealed the individual steps of proton transfer and their sequence. Note that such information could not have been obtained by X-ray crystallography because hydrogen atoms are very hard to detect with this method. After this excursion to bacteriodopsin, we will now return to the calcium ATPase. The use of mutants is one strategy to assign bands in infrared spectra. Another approach is to use isotopes. Why is isotope labeling a powerful technique to assign bands in infrared spectra? As a mass increase lowers the vibrational frequency of an oscillator, isotope labeling shifts band in infrared spectra. Here is shown the absorption band of the unlabeled species and here the absorption band of the labeled species. So when we compare the spectra with and without labeling, we can identify the contribution of the labeled group to the spectrum. There are several labeling strategies. The ideal experiment would be to label a particular amino acid or amino acid side chain. This is a better experiment than using point substitutions of amino acids because these may affect the reaction mechanism and may even inactivate the protein. However, site-directed isotopic labeling is difficult to achieve. It is easier to label all residues that consist of a particular amino acid. For this, the protein is produced recombinantly and the host organism is fed with the labeled amino acid or with a precursor of it. It is also helpful for the interpretation to label particular atoms of a protein. For example, by feeding the host organism with labeled nutritions or by hydrogen deuterium exchange. The latter is simple to achieve by replacing the solvent H2O with the solvent D2O. So, there are many different ways to use isotope labeling in order to interpret infrared spectra. The example that I want to show is isotope labeling of the substrate. We have used this in our work on the calcium ATPase to assign the bands of the phosphate group. The strategy offers fascinating possibilities. It has enabled us to selectively observe one important group in a large protein, which is only transiently present. In other words, it has enabled us to detect two vibrations out of a total of 50,000 protein vibrations. This experiment is a bit complicated and I will show only a simpler variant of it. One of the bands that we're going to assign to the phosphate group is the one inside the box. Here, as you can see, it is at the low wave number end of the spectrum that we have recorded because the phosphorus atom is relatively heavy. This figure shows the result of the isotope labeling experiment. The thin line spectrum is similar to the spectrum shown before. This one. It was obtained with unlabeled caged ADP which means the phosphate oxygens had a mass of 16 daltons. The thick line spectrum here is a repeat of the experiment where a labeled caged ATP was used in which the gamma phosphate oxygens had a mass of 18 daltons. When this caged ATP was photolyzed, it transferred its labeled gamma phosphate to the ATPase, which produced a labeled phosphor enzyme. In the thick line spectrum, the sharp band at 1194 reciprocal centimeters is clearly reduced. Therefore, this band can be assigned to the unlabeled phosphate group of the phosphor enzyme E2P. In other experiments, we have identified a second phosphate band, 
this time at 1137 with the focus setting. But what is the benefit of identifying the phosphate bands in the spectrum? With this information, the phosphate environment in the catalytic side of the ATPase can be modeled with quantum chemical methods. This gives then information on the bond length and bond strengths of the phosphate group. We found that the enzyme environment makes one of the thermal PO bonds shorter. This indicates that the respective phosphate oxygen interacts weaker with the protein environment than with water in an aqueous environment. All other phosphate bonds are unaffected. This is particularly important for the PO bond that connects the phosphate group to the aspartyl residue of the ATPase. This PO bond is cleaved in the next step of the reaction cycle. Since we find the same bond lengths for this bond in the enzyme environment as in water, we conclude that the enzyme environment does not weaken the bond in the E2P intermediate, which is the state just before bond cleavage. Such information cannot be obtained from X-ray crystallography because, first, the resolution of most structures is not good enough to detect bond length changes, and second, the phosphoenzyme E2P is an intermediate in the HPA's reaction cycle, cannot be crystallized. Instead, phosphate analogues like beryllium fluoride are used to crystallize the state, which implies that no information on phosphate bonds can be obtained. In summary, infrared different spectra of protein reactions contain a wealth of information. To reveal this information, the bands in different spectra need to be assigned to the protein groups that cause them. This is not always easy, but several strategies exist. We have discussed a few important ones above. Those and an additional one are listed in this slide. We discussed various strategies for isotopic labeling, the use of mutants, as in the example of bacteriodopsin, and modifying the substrate as, for example, used for the fingerprint approach. In spite of the simplicity of the fingerprint approach, it can give molecular information. Finally, one can also use model compounds which I have not discussed so far. For example, one can record the infrared spectra of ATP, ADP and phosphate to calculate a different spectrum of the ATP hydrolysis reaction. The final slide lists some advantages and disadvantages of vibrational spectroscopy, that is infrared and Raman spectroscopy. Advantages are The vibrational spectrum of a molecule encodes a lot of molecular information. Unfortunately, it is quite hard to extract this information from the spectrum. A number of methods are employed to do this and yield information that is part of the jigsaw puzzle that builds up our knowledge on proteins. In favorable cases, bond lengths and bond geometries can be determined. Vibrational spectroscopy is one of the few methods to characterize the protonation state of functional groups, in particular in time-resolved experiments. Proteins can be investigated that are too large for NMR or too difficult to crystallize for X-ray crystallography. Membrane proteins can also be investigated. These are difficult to crystallize and usually too large for NMR. The sample preparation for standard measurements is simple. The time for recording an infrared spectrum is short, typically less than a minute. Time resolution of infrared spectroscopy is high, up to microseconds with commercial FTIR spectrometer. Infrared and Raman spectroscopy give good value for money and simple spectrometers are not very expensive. Disadvantages are For ordinary infrared and Raman spectroscopy, the signals are weak. This requires high concentrations of the molecule of interest 
which is not always possible to achieve, for example, because some proteins aggregate. Note, however, that the amount of sample for infrared spectroscopy is small, several micrograms, because the sample volume is small, a few microliters. On the other hand, there are specialized techniques with very high sensitivity, like resonance Raman spectroscopy, and several techniques that can measure the vibrational spectrum of nanoscale objects. Water absorbs strongly in a relevant spectral region of the infrared spectrum of proteins. This requires short path lengths of the cuvettes, which makes mixing experiments difficult. It also requires high concentrations of the molecule of interest. In contrast, water is not a problem for Raman spectroscopy. Calculation of the absorption spectrum is difficult for larger molecules like proteins. This makes it difficult to compare experimental results with calculated spectra for model structures. All in all, vibrational spectroscopy has made significant contributions to the understanding of proteins and other biomolecules. It is also very valuable for characterizing biological cells and tissue, a topic that I did not focus on in this lecture. Several recent technical developments have increased the sensitivity of detection and therefore vibrational spectroscopy will continue to be an important tool in the life sciences.